And this is the No Way to Hollywood podcast. Thanks for joining us. Joining us. Thank you for. For thank you. Join. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I apologize for the mood that we're already in. The Whatcha? <laughs> there was talk about doing this entire episode in a Russian accent. and Which in no way would be offensive to anybody. <laughs> anybody. Who could be offended? Putin wouldn't be offended. He'd be into it. <laughs> Uh, and as you already know, we are talking about that movie that we watched last week. <laughs> I believe it's called The Justice League, the Zack Snyder cut, which was actually, in this case, the Luke cut of the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. And I know, and I know, on the preview video, I thought I had not seen this movie, uh, the original theatrical cut, that is. But about halfway through watching it, when Superman came back to life. I went, oh, yeah, I did see that movie in the theater. It took me half the movie to figure it out. Well, that's because apparently, you know, there's some changes between the, you know, Joss Whedon version and the Zack Snyder version, like massive changes. Not to mention the the Luke version of the Zack version. Can Can you explain to me how it would take half a movie for me to figure it out? Well, see, when you start with a terrible film that is completely unmemorable, that's an easy way to not remember that you watched. It, uh, this has happened to me before, and not with like a movie that's been recut. Like I have, th- there was a movie that uh, I checked out from the library because the cover looked cool, and I was like, "Hey, this looks like this could be fun, and it's got like actors that I care about, and like this could be a lot of fun." So let me watch it. So I bring it home and I start watching it, and I'm like, "Something, hmm, something strange." And about 15 minutes in, I was like. I have checked this movie out before, and it was awful. I don't remember it at all. That's why I started watching it again. No! And at this point in time, I couldn't tell you what the title of the film was because... And it will get him again. It'll probably get me again. It's out So there. that's how it happens, Scott. Oh, and not, not to mention the fact that, again, major plot differences, major color differences, editing differences, all that stuff, which if you go back to the last episode, there's some video links in the description. So do that because the, the, the episode was was nothing. It was just us like talking. Like, but like literally the last, like the last five minute one. We did. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. just, just that one. And like I, had, I have some video essays in there. So Scott, you can watch those or you can watch those, which would be awesome because those people are actually good at making video content. Okay. So, Luke, explain why you wanted to do your own cut of the Zack Snyder cut. Okay, I've actually recut films in the past as well. Um, Let the right one in. I recut my own because there were a couple things, just a few things in that film that I was like, eh, don't really like this. Think that that's kind of weird. There's a whole subplot with, like, the guy's dad that means nothing. So I was like, we could save ourselves a little bit of time and just cut that out. There's this subplot that made no sense because it's a single shot in the film that, like, it's kind of like, and, and then I went to look it up afterward, and it was like, yeah, in the book, it's this massive theme that has to do with really nasty, not cool things at all, and I was like, uh, cut that out, you know, <laughs> like all this kind of stuff, and by doing so, the movie was a little bit tighter, it made a lot more sense, and you didn't have these weird, like, you know, meandering things that you were doing. So, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Everybody agrees. Well, I don't know about everybody, but the G- everyone. Baskins, everyone. There's not a single everyone. person. No, the general consensus appears to be that this one's way better. Um, way, way better. Um, because you're starting from such a low bar when you like bring in somebody else to like remake a movie in a completely different style. When the bar is buried in the ground, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard not to yeah, walk you, over it. Yeah, you can just walk right over it. So, um, but everybody also seems to agree that generally that it's kind of bloated. A little long, some stuff, right? The, the Snyder Cut. The Snyder so Cut. So how long yeah. is the Snyder Cut? The Snyder Cut is just about four hours. And how long is the Luke Cut of the Snyder Cut? Okay, well, let, let's just... I just want to <laughs> do this again. We talked about this last week a tiny bit, but I want to I reiterate this again. Mm-hmm. So the question that was posed to me by one of my friends was, well, why didn't they just hire an editor, right? Like, like editors cut things down all the time. Why didn't you just cut the movie down instead of spending $100 million to get Joss to come in and, you know, rework stuff and do all that kind of stuff? And so I was like, that is an interesting question because as someone who enjoys editing, um, what, what would it take to cut this thing? So I sat down and I said, I just want to slash out 
the bloat. I want to cut the fat. Okay, so I'm going to go through. I'm just going to cut things, and I can't cut anything that is truly meaningful to this movie because that wouldn't be, you know, that that wouldn't be okay. Uh, Zach wouldn't let me, you know, if I if I was working with him. And he has some he has some things that he definitely likes his cool shots. So like, so let's keep those in there. And um, I can't also rearrange plot points. I can't do it. Like I am just trying to take this movie and make it shorter. Okay, so that was kind of the parameters that I set for myself. Also because I am editing off of a finalized film, I can't go back and choose new, you know, different takes. I can't, you know, get other footage. I also can't remix. So like I'm doing a lot of crossfading to try and get the music to to flow, but like I, I can't fix certain things. Um also because I'm not recutting, I can't move the opening titles to like get people's names in different places, which we could save about a minute if we had done that. Right. So like I just gave myself some very basic rules of like what would it take and how much could I cut if I just if I just stuck to this rule set, what could I do? And I took the movie from about four hours to uh, just under two hours and 15 minutes. So I cut a little bit over an hour and a half, which is about a feature-length film, you know, like a, a standard, like short, normal feature-length film. I, cu- I cut that out of the film. Okay. Yeah. With that being said, Jonathan, I know you've seen all the different cuts. All, all of them. And I was there in the edit room, man. Let's, so many more. Let's, let's do some comparison, first between theatrical and... Uh, the original Snyder cut. <clears throat> uh, the theatrical cut is well, I mean, it's talked about a lot right now. But basically, the theatrical cut has different color grades, so it's much more colorful. It has Whedon as a writer and director, so they reshot a fair amount of stuff. And this, like, especially now that we have this, the Snyder cut, the Whedon stuff sticks out like a sore thumb of what what was going on there. And when you see like two scenes that were clearly the same basic scene, but Whedon went this way and Zach went this way, you start to appreciate what Zach was doing. You're like, that way makes sense. What was this? Um, it that was the studio head saying, "Hey, Joss, can you um, yeah. can you make this a little more marvelly?" Hey, Marvel, 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 money, Marvel, Mo- money, money, Marvel. So DC, not so much. DC, DC, D- not so much. Okay, so it was also the the plot of the movie is initiated in in perhaps one of the most ridiculous fashions. There's an entire sequence that neither of you have seen where where it starts with Batman and Gotham and some robber guy or something is on a roof and he's trying to escape or something and then the 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 flying demon creature guys hera demons right hera demons appear we don't know what they are they Those just show up metal thing thingies fangs and and they're like they got wings and oh no no it's not the main guy but the not the main guy no, not stephen the, fly, the his, his little his little his little minion thing the minions the yeah. minions okay yeah. some of those show up and uh and batman um ends up saving the guy and killing the para demons <laughs> And one of the parademons explodes, and its guts are all on the wall, and it's like alien blood, you know, like green. And uh, oh, because Batman's like, I don't kill, except, oops, I killed an alien. Well, this Batman definitely kills. That's a good point. He he most certainly he will he will. Hey kill. Zach, yeah, you got that. So, but his the, the parademons guts are on the wall, and it's like the symbol of the three mother boxes. Wh- I don't even wh- that, see exactly. Um, yes. And Batman's like, mm, should probably figure this one out. <laughs> so, so okay. So is is the thing with like um, uh, Lex Luthor like having this vision that like really doesn't that happen. happened in the movie previous? So I think that's still that might still be in there. Uh, t- to be honest, I watched the Justice wow. League theatrical cut once when it came out because my it was the only movie to go see with my nephews and nieces, and I was hanging out with some family visiting. So it was the movie to go see. We went and saw it. I thought it was pretty bad. And there's a couple things I did enjoy in the Whedon cut that are not in the Snyder cut. Uh, Superman smiles, and he's colorful. And, uh, like, like there's, a, there's actually the same shot in, in all the cuts <laughs> uh, of, of Steppenwolf going to punch Superman, and Superman is dodging out of the way in slow motion and kind of looking at the fist as it goes by him. And in the Whedon cut... He looks at it and he kind of smirks. Hmm. 
you know, just like, mm, oh, yes, fists trying to punch me. Um, and I kind of found that kind of thing to be kind of fun. There's there's humor, and it's very Whedon, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. There's there's a moment where Cyborg says, booyah, and, and then, like, him and Superman start laughing. It's pretty bad, guys. Yeah. So, so that was the Whedon cut. It's two hours or so, and it it kind of drags because you're like, why are we still doing this? Cyborg is almost entirely cut out of the movie. In the Snyder cut, he's in the he's in sen- he's almost the emotional core of the whole thing. Yes, absolutely. And in the uh, Whedon cut, he's he's a super cut. He's just he's just gone. He's just he's just like I showed up. Hi. Um, the Flash does not get nearly as cool stuff at all. Uh, Batman. It, it, there's a moment where Aquaman sits down and starts like sharing about like almost way too suddenly with the whole group starts shutting about like his insecurities about his, his mom and his dad and his fears about not being good enough in a kind of comical way and then realizes that he was sitting on the lasso of truth. You know? Uh, Whedon. Whedon special right there. So my point is lots of jokes that don't necessarily fit. Um, the cool stuff is eh. there. there's a subplot about the Chernobyl kind of place that they go to. Um, that entire place is like abandoned, but there's apparently poor people who live near it. Never mind that likely they would not ne- live near it because they would probably die from radiation if it really is that situation. But there's people living there. It's like there's apparently like one family. There's like one family living there, and eventually the Flash and Superman have to try to save them, or the Flash saves them and the Superman saves more people. It's pretty bad. So. All of this to say, it's pretty bad. And then you get into the Zack Snyder cut. Mm -hmm. And as a as a film guy, I was like, this is just I got to know what this is. This is I'm not necessarily the craziest fan of Zack Snyder. I'm not necessarily the craziest fan of DC movies. I was not one of the guy fanboys who's like, release the Snyder cut like day one of Justice League not having Zack Snyder in it years ago. I'm not that guy. I'm nowhere close to that guy. But they, you know, ever since they said we're going to do it, I'm like, well, this is fascinating. Now we're going to see even more of what the decisions were for that. Now we're going to see what his decisions are. We're going to compare two filmmakers. We're going to compare, you know, all these things. And then it was four hours. I was like, wow. And then it was, you know, four by three. I was like, okay. Um, And watching it, though, I found myself very much enjoying it. I found it a lot better, a lot, lot better than the other one. And, uh, it is like Steppenwolf is another great example. Steppenwolf in the original Justice League, truly his design makes him look like a, a weird gray dude in like some medieval armor and not even like not even cool armor. Like you you start a World of Warcraft and you have no armor and you actually got a worse set than what you started with. Like that kind of armor. Hmm. And and he is not intimidating. He is dull and boring. Steppenwolf showed up in this one. His face looks different. He looks more alien. He's imposing. His armor is very cool and very interesting to look at. He he is a like the sequence of the the Amazons trying to stop him in the Zack Snyder cut hold, like holds weight, and it like I I felt it, mm-hmm. and it felt he felt cool but also intimidating. Kind of like okay, how do you stop this guy? It made sense. And the Whedon cut, it was like big guy shows up and they can't stop him because they can't stop. Like it didn't feel imposing so there's all sorts of stuff we could go through but the Zack Snyder cut is better I enjoyed watching it I enjoyed that they did it sort of in a way that you could kind of watch it you don't have to sit down and watch it in four hours you can just sort of be like oh there's a few chapters I'm done okay now I'll do another few chapters today um a lot better a lot better paced I never felt like it was dragging personally I never I never really felt that I mean I could definitely be like yeah, we don't need this and we could cut this and there's a couple there's a line here or there's a women singing for a while and smelling Aquaman's shirt and you're kind of like don't have any idea why we're doing this. <laughs> um, so there's stuff like that that definitely shows up. I'm like, Zach, I like it when you indulge on this side of things, character-wise, but I really don't understand what the crap you're doing over here. Um, so that was kind of my impression of the Zack Snyder cut. Okay. Now, having heard what Luke said he tried to do with the Snyder cut, do you think Luke was successful? Or did he cut too much? Did he uh, cut too little? He cut too deep and too greedily. And First awakened cut a is the deepest. Um, and awakened the Balrog. <laughs> <laughs> he, he 
cut too greedily <laughs> too deep. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I think Luke did a... I saw why he was doing what he was doing, but I talked to him right after we watched it, and there are definitely... Like, it's amazing how I was actually... Some things were literally just a shot that he came in later. And I would go, and I'd be like, Luke... If I was in the edit room with you, I'd tell you to keep the shot where it started and to not cut in literally maybe maybe five seconds later, maybe. It's and it's amazing how and, and part of it is I can't go into Luke's cut with fresh eyes. I can't. I've seen all the cuts and I just saw the Zack Snyder cut not that long ago. So I I know what that shot is beforehand. And so since it left an impression on me. I was like, I think you should probably keep that in for this for that reason. We talked about that. There's some interesting things to talk about there. But for the most part, you know, Luke was going to try to keep Zach's cool moments. He couldn't change story beats mostly. And he had to make it shorter. So the whole question was, can he make it compelling on some level? And it's not even really about being compelling. It's about, like, can you make the story still happen and be shorter? And the answer is, yes, you can. And he did it successfully. Now, what I told him was there are places that feel very gutted and not in a good way. Some places it's fine. In other places, it's like I feel things missing. I feel pacing problems. I feel like I don't know where I am necessarily. I'm a little, like, I'm a little bit lost now because I don't necessarily have this truly like, this establishing shot, which isn't necessarily that big of a deal. But on the other hand, it, it does something. And... The emotional beats, as much as you may not care about that character arc or you may criticize it, um, there are beats and they work the way that they are in the Zack Snyder cut. You understand the character is here and it's now here and it's now here. And that's good. And so Luke had to, by necessity, to get it down to under two hours, he had to find a way to to get some of that stuff cut. And some things I loved. Like there's this one cut he does where Wonder Woman in the Zack Snyder cut... Wonder Woman saves a bunch of people in the very beginning. And some little girl is like, can I grow up to be just like you? And in the movie, the Zack Snyder cut, Wonder Woman's like, you can grow up to be whatever you want to be. Denying, you know, except for the fact that Wonder Woman's a goddess who grew up on a deserted island that no one can ever get to as a specific distant race. There are aliens in this universe. I don't think the kid can be aliens if they want to be. Like, there's a lot of things that I'm pretty sure that little girl cannot be. Um, Wonder Woman's one of them and it's not a good moment because it's actually dumb um, it does not put Wonder Woman in a good light and now she's lying to children so I don't like that line it's a stupid line and at best it's some agenda bull schnizzle so what Luke did I very much appreciate it which is the girl looks at Wonder Woman and says can I grow up to be like you and we cut back to Wonder Woman and she just smiles she just smiles at the girl and it's like what would you say to the child? Mm. I don't know. Why don't you just smile at her and let's move on. Let's get out of the situation. And it actually works a lot better. And this makes me think of a different thing, which is in the movie Draft Day, which is way, way to the side. Mm, draft Day. But it's Kevin Costner. And the point is Kevin Costner's been in the movies for a long time. And I forget if it was the director or somebody else was talking to him. And they were, he was workshopping a scene with him as an actor. And Kevin Costner said, well, why don't we just cut this whole like, page of dialogue and why don't you just put my hand on his shoulder? And it works, apparently. Like They're like, oh, you know what? That actually works a lot. Let's just cut the whole scene of dialogue and let's just have you portray. <laughs> and that's the thing is uh, film and because of the medium, like we get certain advantages. And one of the advantages is we can do a cut to a person smiling, cut to a person just like looking at someone, putting their hand on their shoulder. And that is the moment. That is the scene. That does convey the emotion. And so that was, I think, an excellent use of how we can have an advantage, you know, in a scene and cut some stuff out or change it for the better. Um and then on the flip side, there are things where like, I kind of like that though, or I kind of like this, or, or so. So anyway, it was a little uneven for me, but it did hit the goal of, I knew what the plot points were. Mm -hmm. I knew it was happening. Mm -hmm. We got to the end. The cool Zack Snyder stuff was still there for the most part. And the, um, the movie is under two hours. Um, but again, or right at, right at, but, but again, um, fascinatingly enough, the four hour version has a good pacing that neither cut feels this like neither cut feels that good as far as it's pacing hmm. or it's or it's compelling emotional arcs and one last comment i will just say is there's the amazon scene steppenwolf shows up and basically wrecks the amazons um and gets the box and leaves and the Zack snyder cut it's much longer and that had 
uh, that made a feeling. Uh, there, there's a kind of a two sections. There's spoilers, obviously, if you haven't seen this movie in any form. Um, there's the section where Steppenwolf shows up, and like two all the way through, they close the 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 dome and it crashes into the into the water. That's one section. And then Steppenwolf like pops out of the ocean and is like, I'm going to wreck you and get that, that box. Um, and that's another section. And both are longer in the Snyder Cut than the Luke Cut. And what was fascinating was in the Snyder Cut, I had a strangely strong emotional connection to uh, trying to get out of the dome and watching all these women sacrifice their lives to stop this guy. Just, just automatically, we're going to do that. The whole reason we're trained for this, like we're doing it, and it was strangely very emotionally compelling. In Luke's version, it was not nearly as compelling to me. But what was also fascinating was that in the Snyder Cut, after that emotional compelling thing, he pops out, and that was very, that was also very intimidating and very good. And then he was wrecking people, and that was also whoa, okay. But then it started to go on too long. Then it started to lose any emotional compelling for me in the Snyder Cut. I started to be like, okay, I get it. He's strong and he can't, like, okay, I, I get it. I get, just give him the mother box. Let's move on. Like, I know what you have to do now, right? <laughs> and, and that did not feel right. And there's this whole moment where the, you know, one person's dying, the person's looking at them, and it's supposed to be sad. And like, I didn't, I didn't care. I'm watching Luke's version, and now I don't, I don't have nearly the same emotional connection with the dome falling. But going through the next part of the sequence, which is also a little bit tighter, but going through that part of the sequence um, and getting to the end where the person's dying, suddenly that felt far more emotional and compelling. So the two different cuts of the same sequence with largely the same beats, not a ton different, like, but something about that pacing change actually shifted my emotional response to two different moments. It didn't kill it. It just actually moved it to a different part of the scene. So... And that may be better because then your emotional climax is at the end of the sequence, whereas for the Snyder Cut, my emotional climax was actually the uh, middle of the sequence. And then a big surprise and then kind of being like, eh, let's, let's get on with it. Um, so those are just some observations. Uh, speaking as the person who doesn't enjoy comic book movies. Doesn't like them. Luke, I still didn't like it, but that's okay. I, but I... I cut it down. <laughs> I appreciated no that. I, I appreciated that I did not waste four hours of my life watching this movie. I only wasted two hours and fifteen minutes. Okay, so I I know that you do not like superhero movies. I get that, but like, so Justice League has a particular problem plot wise that it's you can't cut you can't, out. You can't cut it out. It's the Justice League. Well, <laughs> in this in this instance, it's specifically Superman is dead, but we're gonna bring him back to life. Is that one of your pet peeves? That's one of your pet peeves, right? Is there's the yeah, there's that, the that's, that's uh, a pet the flashback thing as a pet peeve. There's you can't shouldn't bring anybody back as a pet peeve. Is there another pet peeve I'm forgetting? I feel like there's three there, like majors. Mm, maybe. Okay. I mean, flashbacks depends on the story, right? Not Star Wars. Okay, but not like, Star Wars. So, so okay, I I know. So like okay, but like given that that's what the story was. <sighs> okay. I'll accept this. Why didn't you just rewrite the movie and film it again, you <laughs> jerk? Because that wasn't my goal. Get my good. Go that wasn't my goal. Okay, so, but, like, like, Ugh. like, if you were just, like, going on the ride, right? Like, okay. like, you're like, you're like, okay, this plot point is stupid. But going on the ride, how is the ride? The rest of the ride, I thought, was actually pretty good. And I will say that my memory of the Whedon cu a theatrical cut was not nearly as favorable the, as your cut. The vague stench brought back by watching the same images. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So I have never, I, I had not until last week seen the loop cut. I had cut the loop cut, but I hadn't <laughs> watched, I hadn't watched it. Like I hadn't said, like I truly just, I spent like a week in the evening, every couple, you know, I had a little bit of time here and there and I was just be like, what else can I cut from there? Oh man, I've got 15 minutes. Oh, I'm so happy. You know, like, like each, <laughs> each section, I'm like, oh, and I just got another like eight seconds. Oh, like that. I was truly just on like, just slash and burn. You know, that was just my, my goal. Like, can I do it? And how, how low can I get it? And I even kept in the epilogue, which is why it's over two hours. If you cut out the epilogue, like it would be shorter. Right. So like, there's a lot of stuff in here that like, I was, I was just trying to like, it was an exercise in like, here are the parameters that I've given myself, like a good poem, what can I do with it? And I had a blast editing it. And then I sat down to watch it, and I was like, 
okay, yeah, there, there's some problems here. <laughs> you know, like there's, there, there are issues. Right. And then talking with Jonathan, and he was like, okay, well, you're missing some emotional beats. I actually like this shot and this piece because this is cooler because, yeah, it takes a little bit more time, but, like, it introduces this idea. And so the shot that he talked about in particular is this moment where the um, – uh, it starts we, on water. Yeah, it just starts on water. It just starts on a, like you cut from one thing, you cut to water, and you just don't, you don't, you're like, okay, I'm at a beach, and then out of the water appear parademons, and then you see that they're dragging out of the water Atlanteans, and there's this moment of like, oh dang, so the the bad guys went into the ocean where humans would not have any sort of success. <laughs> they went in there, found the like most powerful thing down there grabbed them and ripped them out of their environment and said, come up here and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, and and that has actually been mentioned earlier in the movie. Like, that's a thing that, that was brought up when Aquaman's talking in the water bubbles, which is super awesome. Like, that, that's a cool effect. I was like, I gotta keep a lot of this in here, <laughs> even though this dialogue's all done, but, like, I gotta keep this cool shot. Okay, so, like, there's... Th this is a major key thing, and Jonathan's like, I like that shot starting with the water. And, like, I had cut in later where it's like they're just dragging them onto the onto the onto the beach but like i was like okay that actually makes a lot of sense and this led to a very interesting thought for me which is as the editor i've got a specific task ahead of me that i'm working on and it actually helps to have a director type person come along and say but actually i want this because of this reason and being like oh yeah see that makes a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense so then what i was thinking as i watched this movie that i cut i was like oh you know, and now that I've done my kind of first pass and like, can I do this rule, you know, this role thing with these specific rules, I, like I would totally slash out huge sections and take this sequence out and pull that. And like, then, yeah, I'll give you 10 more seconds on the water. That is fine. Like we got plenty of time for that. And um, so, so it was interesting to kind of even go through that process of there is the technical side of editing, just like slash, slash, slash. Can I make it flow? Can I make it work? And then there's the emotional side of editing that like the storytelling and talking to somebody who has a passion about it. Like, and again, I, I, I kind of had my little Zach on my shoulder being like, no, you can't cut that. This is too cool. You know, like, <laughs> little Zach. Do you have a little Whedon too? <laughs> no, 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 no. Whedon wasn't Reshoot there. Shoot it. Make it more colorful. Whedon wasn't there. I, I wasn't doing the Whedon. There cut. could be a joke here. <laughs> so, so I was trying to be true to the original vision, but it helps to then have somebody who has an alternate perspective and an emotional connection to it to say, no, actually, we need, we, need, we need to stretch this back out or we need to put this back in or we need to do this because this is actually really meaningful. And um, I, I think that had I spent, you know, another couple weeks kind of mulling over it, I may have gotten there a little bit more. But this was truly just an exercise. But it was interesting that this exercise showed so clearly that the role of, like, collaboration in content – is so important. It can't just be, and then there goes in there and slashes it all up and everything's cool. It's like, no, we need to go back through and have the dialogue and have this kind of back and forth and work through stuff and say, how do we make this scene work even better? It sounds like you're trying to say that Lucas should have had someone to tell him no when he made the prequels. Um, I'm not the first person to say that, and the people who have said that said it better, and they're right. So good job, Scott. Yes, I agree with you. I, I will say that one of the interesting observations – for me was beyond like some cool like oh that sequence actually feels different because of this um to, to your point like i can see better now how um the whedon cut might exist that, or i might see and it's not really the whedon because the whedon cut is also like extraordinary because they reshot things and you're like why again it's sort of a just take the footage that's there, complete it, and then cut it down to what you need it to be. That's one thing, and you can do that, and you can have something. But what they did with Whedon was spend the money and time to try to reshoot it to make it more like Marvel and all these other things. It just, just doesn't fit. So anyway, um, thinking about it and going, you know, I can see how movies that I've seen before in the theater or, you know, whatever, and watch them and thought, you know... I feel like there might have been a good movie in there, but it just feels too rushed or it just doesn't feel like I didn't have emotional connection or something is missing about this. And now having seen the Whedon, the Snyder, and now Luke's cut and just seeing these different editing approaches, these different rewriting approaches and so on and so forth, even just from Snyder to Luke's cut where you could, if you were being hampered by – you're being uh, – not hampered, but uh, hassled basically – by execs and the director wasn't allowed to be around like, hey you're you're fired get out of the editing room and the execs and the editor will take care of it 
And even the editor may not be able to make the choices he wants to make, he or she wants to make. And so now the executive are like, no, you're going to do this. You're going to get it here. I mean, I want it under 215. You hear me? I want it under 215 because our marketing says if it's under 215, we're going to get a big, you know, big box office payday. And you can see where if you have that sort of clinical just slashing approach, how you really are going to like, of course, it's an art form. I mean, as a film guy, like if someone told me that, I'd be like, well, duh. But it's it's also one of those things where you you just you kind of see where people you know care about that kind of stuff, even when they get into that motor or whatever. Like you can see how things can just be close but not there. They're not like something doesn't feel right. Something's something's not. It's just it's it's not there. And so I felt that before in the theater, and you know you kind of just say, well, I can try to diagnose what it is. Could be the editing, could be this or the other, but I don't necessarily really know. It could just be that they didn't have a chance to execute very well, and the editor had nothing to work with. Like I, I don't know what happened. I just know it didn't get anywhere close. And now I have a, a maybe a stronger sense of, yeah, I think you might have just butchered this <laughs> a little bit more than you should have. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to know more of now. And that makes me think. Link below about um, a discussion uh, that a YouTuber who's really into editing and talking about that kind of stuff talked about the videos that he thought, the movies that he thought would win for best editing, and then talks about why Bohemian Rhapsody is actually really poorly edited. And then what's awesome is that his video essay got seen by the editor of Bohemian Rhapsody, who is on a podcast live thing and talking about it. And so he kind of has some stuff to say. And then the guy made a response to that video and was like, so the guy agreed with me. <laughs> and then <laughs> it's awesome. Um, it's, it's a fun little ex exchange and talking about kind of the process and the difficulty. And when you're up against deadline and do you not have enough time and you've got people talking in your ear saying you got to do it this way. And so you can just end up in this place where like your stuff isn't what isn't your best it's not what you would even want but it's what just came out because of the factors that are associated with it and in this case like again i didn't even watch it you know until i watched it and watching it was very clear like okay yeah there is some stuff here that you know if i was going to spend more time on it um i i could make it a lot better we could make this a lot better well i, I think it's also interesting to see like, I think I'm starting to be able to differentiate more and more, like, what do I think a writing problem probably is, what I think a act, well, I don't, acting, unless it really stands out to me, I'm not sure I quite catch on, like, oh, that's an acting problem, or people are like, that's a bad performance, I'm like, I, I was, whatever, the person was there and they did the thing. Um, well, and also, editing can dramatically impact people's performance. Sure. Editing, music, visual effect, I mean, but but the editing thing now, and, and we've all, you know, it's long been said that it, Editing is the art you should never have seen. Like, the whole thing is that you should never feel it. It should just be you're in the movie. And so it's very true, then, if you are feeling things and they aren't good and you're not able to say it's a writing, an acting, or a visual, you know, if you're not able to pinpoint it to something, it's very likely the editing, which may or may not be the editor's choice or an exec's choice or a you don't have what you need to do this right choice. But if it's a Superman shouldn't have come back, that's a writing problem, right? Like, mm -hmm. this whole thing is Very coming... Very clearly, I can pinpoint it on the writing. Yeah, like, it's, we chose to do this. This is the story we're trying to tell. And so, no editor has the way of getting around that unless they're able to change this, the writing and the story, which sometimes happens, but generally not. And so, you got to keep this whole Superman plot. So, if you don't like the Superman plot, you don't like the writing of that film. Um, if you don't like a moment... And how it plays, that's something to more to do with the craft of editing, the craft, maybe maybe acting, uh, maybe music cue or something like that, where the mix is making you feel something different. Because that's the other thing is music is the invisible, visceral feeling. I mean, it literally goes physically into your ears and in the back door, as they say, and makes you feel things. So there's a lot of different options. But, yeah, now I have a stronger sense of. And I, and I, yeah, I've, I've long thought, okay, I don't know why you chose to do this, this whole idea here and this structure thing here, it's all dumb, shouldn't have done it, should rewrite that, right? And I, I always think that way, so I can see writing problems, I think, pretty clearly. It's kind of a, shouldn't have done that, <laughs> shouldn't have gone there, shouldn't be trying to do this, or that structure doesn't make sense. Um, but in a different structure way, or in a moment by moment, or a feeling, or something just seems off about this, or I don't know where I am, you're probably more in an editing issue than you are necessarily a writing issue. Yeah, and um, I, as much as I can see the issues with my edit, right, there are also things that I very much love 
Like, cutting out the, can I be just like you? Super dumb line. No. And it was dumb when I watched it the first time. I was like, I don't know why this is here. We're cutting it out, right? And then... And it's seamless, by the way. His yeah. cut of that out is completely seamless. Yeah. Also, at the very end, like, another thing, as I'm cutting, I'm like, wow, we can, like, get rid of all the dumb language in this. And by dumb language, I mean bad language, right? So, like, when, when Batman and the Nightmare is like... I will effing kill you. That I was, was impressive. Like, I, I was I was like, we don't need that. I was like, can my software do this? And I snip snip and uh, use a little, you know, little blend, blend and yep, the scene gone. It's just gone. Like the F word's just out. And I was like, yes. Okay. But my favorite yeah. edit piece, because when I watched the film the first time, I was like, this is so strange. There's this moment where these guys are coming in to do a thing at a bank and they like pull up in their in their van and they get out and they like holding their guns and they like look up and down the street and they like walk menacingly towards the front of the building and then they like get they, they like one of the guys gets all the way past the guard before the guard is like hang on whoa and he like pulls up his gun and then they shoot him right and like when i watched i was like that what <laughs> <laughs> this makes no sense at all. Was the guard asleep for half of it? Like, nothing makes sense with this sequence. And so I was able to go in and be like, we're going to tighten this, we're going to clip this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to make this reaction happen here. And, like, it feels so much better to me. And and because of that, I was like, this is a moment where truly, I think the editing in the original was actually not up to, up to snuff or what mm. I would like because mm. this sequence literally doesn't make sense until we kind of tighten it up and make it work a little bit better. Now... After that, I then go on my hacking spree and I tighten it up too much and the next sequence kind of loses a little bit. But <laughs> I mean, to your credit, I didn't think about that particular sequence at all, which suggests then that it was invisible, which is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So I was just like, okay, they're doing the thing and that's fine. Um, I was probably, and that's the other thing, we, we, I was probably extra harsh on Luke just because i just seen the other cut and I'm in, I'm in analytical mode. I'm not in being the movie mode because it's I, I know this story already and I know this other version. So I'm too I'm too like, what's this versus that versus this versus that. So that's the other thing going on. But again, to your credit, I like the the Amazon sequence where they're all getting ready. There's this box in the middle of the room and they're all like, oh, is something going to happen? And then this portal shows up. And Luke had told me about this beforehand, so I was paying attention. And there's there's two times he does this, and one time. I see that there's hard there's a hardship just because of the footage that you have and so on and so forth, um, and I also think there's a beat you need to have, which that's another comfort. But yes, but before that, like in the Snyder Cut room, all these people getting ready to fight just in case something shows up, and lo and behold, something does show up. Mm -hmm. A portal shows up, and parademons fly out. Okay, and in the in the Snyder Cut, you have a fair amount of time of like looking at parademons showing up. And they're, they're literally, like, they fly out, and then they just, like, buzz around the room. like. And these people who are here defending this box are standing there, and they're fighters. They're standing there, and they're like, uh, oh. And as I watched it, I was like, this is dumb. Like, this, 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 this doesn't make any sense. These people are defending a box, and now an invading force has shown up, and no one's fighting. What's going on? So can I make it that they show up and start killing people immediately? Because that would make more sense. And it feels a lot better. Now, I, again, making the movie, I would prefer to have a shot of, like, one of the parademons, just like a close-up or something, so I can get that moment of, they know what this is, and so they now, they know they're engaged. I just, I just need that little brief, like, it doesn't have to be long, just, oh, clearly evil creature, <laughs> kill it! Um, and we don't have that, but still, it works really well, because it feels right. It feels like thing shows up you know it's got to be bad and it gets it gets bad we're just we're in the middle of a fight it feels it feels yep. serious it feels they, like it has they gravitas come, they come out they come out shooting like wow imagine that yeah mm -hmm. it, it feels right so there's there's some good but, stuff in there but as jonathan pointed out and i knew um when steppenwolf then warps in later like he he's like he's kind of a non-entity for a long time because he's just kind of there um he just kind of like shows up and everybody's like oh. whereas in the snyder cut because it's written this way the parademons show up and they're like we're just gonna chill until our master comes and does his cool entrance so we're just hmm. gonna be here to like you know kind of the first wave so we're just hanging here everybody getting ready good you get psyched up for this thing okay watch this and then he's like boom and then he lands and he stands up he's like I am here and I will fight you all. <laughs> and still nobody's shooting. And they's like, now let's fight. And they like hit somebody. And then everybody's like, oh, now we'll fight you. And I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. But it, but we lose that moment of the Steppenwolf, it, you know, kind of reveal because of it. And there's two, there, I would say there's two crafts that I would come after about that. I would not come after the editor. I would come after the director. 
and I would come after the writer on those two because there is a moment here, an introduction here, and the writer has it. I don't know how the writer had it, but at whatever point, the director went along with it and said, okay, we will do it this way, where it is this, let's take our time and whatever. And that's where I feel like a director really can step in, even if there's a script that says that, and say, you know what we need to do? We need to tighten this up because I think it'd be a lot better if they came out shooting and we did this thing and we sort of introduced them in this other way over here and that will play better, I think. And like that's where a director can step in and sort of throw their weight around and make a great sequence out of something. Or, yeah. You know, they can really do that. And then the editor just has to let that be smooth and play it out. And, and sometimes you can get away with doing something in the edit to solve that problem when you realize it late. But – it does feel to me like it was probably a director writer issue. And I, I think I put a lot of that on the director actually. And and the way that I think I would change that sequence now knowing it, because you do want the parody to show up and you want them to start shooting, and then you want Steppenwolf. But like I think what I would like is I would like Steppenwolf to like truly just own the Amazons for a little while. And then after he's like kind of all got them like knocked down on the ground and they're all like scrambling, like, what are we gonna do? That's when you can be like, now you will know fear. Well, and, and this is and this is the thing where again, a look, putting your hand on someone's shoulder. If if it was done in such a way that sure, parademons come out, just start shooting and things are just chaotic, and then you hear a big boom and you're in the you know, you kind of go into one of the Amazons who's fighting a parademon yep. close to it, and you kinda of get their perspective when they're fighting something, they kinda of look to the left and then there's just this imposing figure for yep. a second yep. and the figure looks at them with no mercy. And just no, like and just like kills them. Yeah, I mean it's a cliche in itself, but so right. is the villain coming up. And, I am villain. Yeah, you all bad. You suck. Well, I take pox. Well, especially when it's like you will know fear, and then they're like, we don't have any fear, and you're like, well then yeah. why are we having this conversation? <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe they thought that was really cool. I guess like, right. Yeah, Amazon's young. They have no fear. Is cool, and it's like, I... yeah, I mean, right. And but demonstrate it, show it, which you do. And later on, you do some really cool stuff with that, right? Right, right. And it's like it's again like Steppenwolf shows up, and if he's actually a good design, he's imposing. And if he kills somebody right at the bat and has no mercy, he's imposing. And then you do another Amazon, like the Queen, maybe on the other side of the room, looking at him, and they look at each other, and it's like, and then she goes after him. Yeah, she yeah. goes after him because she's not scared, right? Yeah. Like yep. I'm scary. I'm not scared, right? Like, it's there in the visuals. It's there in the execution of the story. Not necessarily because I will, you will know fear. You will know it. And, and, and was like, we don't know fear. Sometimes you just got to cut out the dialogue. Sometimes the dialogue just got to get cut. Cut it out. Especially when you uh, insinuate that you could become an Amazon woman. All right. Uh, Amazon. Luke. Yeah. Is there a favorite moment in your cut? that you have that you just went oh this this is it this is this made it for me i mean i i, ha I had a lot of moments where i was like oh that works so well <laughs> I'm, I'm having so much fun doing this like it was truly a lot of fun i was having fun doing it um it, it was the first time that i've gotten into like editing and just just for the pure like joy of like slashing stuff and being like what can we do with it it, it was a it was an exercise in what's possible and that was a lot of fun. Um, I've already mentioned them. I think I think truly the moment that I'm most proud of is fixing the going into the bake sequence because I actually felt like it was wrong in the actual original edit. And being able to cut out a line of dialogue that I thought was dumb, being able to cut out a swear word because it was completely unnecessary, being able to kind of just tighten things down, like that was all a lot of fun for me. So it was mostly just the whole thing was kind of fun. And I also really liked just going into my timeline and I even like put markers in because he has his little sections of like, you know, this is this is one and this is two and chapter six and epilogue and all this. And, and like I would put those in and I'd be like, I have cut 18 minutes from this <laughs> sequence. I'm so happy right now. Like, I'm, oh, it's so good. Uh, Jonathan, was there a moment as you were watching Luke's cut <clears throat> when you thought, "Oh yeah, that's 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 a good moment that should have happened this way"? Well, and I think that's why we, I geeked out there for a little bit, as I, I really do enjoy the parody is just showing up and just starting to kill everybody because it feels way better. It feels way more intimidating and intense and interesting. Like as an action sequence junkie, I really enjoy that. Um, I don't know if there was another moment quite like that. Um, I, I think they stood out to me, which is why I probably already talked about them. And, and that's where the line of dialogue, because because in the original cut, that line of dialogue truly took me out of the movie and made me go, this is dumb. 
This is a dumb thing. And so getting it like just like killing that, taking that out and letting that moment play and let it be something that you can essentially interpret really lets that moment play then. Now it's a moment that can play and it can be whatever, you know, if you want to if you think you she could be then fine, think that, but you're wrong. And the rest of us can be like cool, you know, like it she cares about this kid, but there's also sort of a there's like a twinkle in her eye like no you can't, but I'm flattered and and maybe there's another way you can be good, right? Like there's something there now. As where last time it was truly shut up. Get just get <laughs> out of here. Okay, yes, I will okay, yes. I will also say just talking about this again. I there were definitely parts that were that were way worse in my cut. And and I knew it going into it and I think the biggest thing is that there is a sequence that exists purely to like get them to go underground into these tunnels and like it's 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 truly the scene to like look cool and get the characters to move from this location and fan service. It's for fan service. And to this section, right. And as I watched it, I was like, I don't care about any of this stuff. This is all really annoying. And so, like, I was just cutting along, and I was like, this this should go. This should go. This should go. And, like, oh, everything related to this character needs to go. And so I was just slashing this stuff out. And then I'm like, oh, we got to this sequence, this one moment where this character is delivering their one and only important line in the entire film. And it's the only thing that gets the characters from here to here. And so, like, I left the line – in this movie, but like if you'd been watching it, you'd be like, I don't know who this character is because they just came out of nowhere and they just said this one line and then everybody went to this other place because yeah. there was truly no other way to get around it. And that was one of those sequences where as the editor going through, I'd be like, um, this scene we need to rewrite and have Batman say this one line because I really don't understand what's going on. Right. right so right. so like there were sequences like that and that, that was the worst one. There were several that were like that where I was like, I have to do this because – but. It's truly worse. It is truly worse. However, there were other parts where, like, Batman or uh, Superman and Lois go off to the house and, like, they they do this thing and they have this little conversation, and then and then like later, you know, like Batman's or Superman's mom shows up and then they continue to have this conversation, which ultimately culminates with Superman being like, "Hey, by the way, they brought me back to life, so I should probably go figure out what that is." But like, they've been fighting the bad guys for like thirty minutes while he's been like having this conversation with both, well, you know, and the, and then his mom. And so what I did was I was able to take his one line and put it in the first sequence and make it make sense, and then we just cut all this stuff out, and it it works so much better for me, right? And so there are there were a couple places where I was like, oh. Like being able to just slash that whole thing makes this whole thing make way more sense, and it feels better from a pacing standpoint. So there are parts that way worse, and there were several places I was like, "Ooh, I, I'm I'm getting goosebumps." Well, I, I will admit in this version, your cut, Luke, I appreciated the fact that the other characters went into battle, and I still didn't have a clue if Superman was going to show up or not. Mm. And I mean, I assumed he was. But they kind of got into it, and I'm going, is he going to show up now? Okay. And there, and there was a bit of tension there mm-hmm. that I think was important to have, right? Okay, and speaking of tension, the other thing that I cut was how many times f- the Flash, like, trips and falls while going at light speed. Like, like, like so often in the Snyder Cut, like, he's just always, like, tripping over himself or knocking into something or, or getting hurt and, like, pulling a muscle or whatever. You know, like, it's just, like, over and over. I was like, good grief, this joke is not funny. And so, like, mm-hmm. we keep, like, the one time where it's actually important to, like, the plot. And then the rest of the time we just cut those out and let him be bumbling in his language because he's talking, like, his brain's just going so fast that he can't keep up with his own thoughts, you know? And so we do that instead. And we can keep that stuff while getting rid of, like, this... Why is he always tripping in this movie? I don't understand. Like, it just doesn't make sense for The Flash to constantly be tripping. I just don't get it. So, um, yeah. But And then there's stuff that I love. And so I left it. You know, like when he's going when he's going really fast around Superman, he looks at Superman. And then Superman is like, yeah, I see. <laughs> it's just great. It's just great stuff. There's good stuff. Okay, sorry. That was a pretty good moment, too. Yeah. It's, it's, and so one other comment is it's in the Luke cut and the Snyder cut. It wasn't in the Whedon version, but it's far superior than the other version. It's... it's the Flash being the guy who saves the day, like the whole movie, actually rests like it re- everybody has a moment in the sun in one way or another. If anyone gets short shrift, I think it's more like Aquaman. Um, but most characters do something super duper important mm-hmm. at that last battle to make sure, that, like, if you don't do this, the whole thing falls apart. Well, if they don't do that, the whole thing falls apart. And 
it's a great moment to have everybody fail, including Superman. Superman is defeated, not because he's not powerful, but because he's not there in time. They don't take these things apart, and the whole thing is just doomsday world, and they get blown up. But the only person who can do something about it is the guy who can run so fast he goes back in time, and he's hurt, and he and he didn't show up when he was supposed to, so the whole thing is like his fault too. And then he sees it, and he, and he you know, okay, I gotta go, I gotta go so fast, gotta break the rule, gotta go back in time, gotta do it now, or it's all over. And he, you know, he goes and he does it, and that's a great moment in the Snyder Cut, and it's a great moment in the Luke Cut, and it's just a, a far superior, far superior thing. Yeah, and not remembering the theatrical version as much, I would tell you that that whole end fight, him having to go back in time was possibly the most interesting part of the movie for me, even though I didn't, still didn't like the movie. So if only the way that they brought Superman back was by having the Flash go back in time, then Scott would have been okay with it. It would have made a lot more sense than what they actually did. <laughs> you kidding me? The I mean, mother boxes, dude. The mother boxes. They're those, change machines. Um, those mother boxes. <laughs> mother change boxes. machines. You could <laughs> all <laughs> use a little World change. enders. <laughs> Well, thank you for got nothing left. Thank yeah. you for joining us on this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and we will catch you again next time. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed watching a, a video essay talking about a movie you can't see because piracy laws and stuff. <laughs> it was interesting. Luke doesn't want to wave. He never waves. Why doesn't Luke wave? It's like one of my things. It's we should go back in time. And make him wave. Gotta go back, go back right now. Make Luke wave. And then I go back in time. You know what Luke's gonna do?